Well, good morning. If uh, I could have your attention, I'm Bryce Harris, Chancellor of the California Community Colleges, and it is certainly my pleasure to welcome you to this 15th annual uh, Dr. John W. Rice Diversity and Equity Award Ceremony. Before we get started, I hope you'll uh, join me in thanking our very talented musical group, Franklin Court. Thank you, gentlemen. I really uh, also want to thank our special guests, uh, many of whom you will hear from later in the program, but I want to acknowledge uh, Dr. Rice's widow, Clara Rice, our, uh, our keynote speaker, who I know you're going to enjoy meeting and hearing from, Commander Zoe Dunning. And uh, I want to acknowledge the president of the Foundation for California's Community College, Keitha Mills. And of course, we especially want to express our appreciation to the Foundation for underwriting the cost of this annual activity. Uh, as you heard, this is the 15th annual activity. It's uh, a wonderful endorsement of the commitment we have to diversity and equity in California, and the Foundation underwrites that. Please join me in thanking them. On the uh, table over here, we have uh, uh, various uh, resolutions provided by members of the U.S. Congress and the California Assembly, and I hope all of you will stop and take a look at some of those, uh, honoring our honorees this morning. And so uh, it's a pleasure to uh, acknowledge the Assembly and the Congress for their support. I also want to acknowledge uh, two members of the governor's staff that are with us this morning, uh, Daniel Calabretta and Jason McCannell. Gentlemen, would you stand? Thank you. And from Assemblymember McCarty's uh, office, Aubrey Fong. Aubrey? Oh, right there. Thank you. Uh, we certainly appreciate uh, the dedication of all the uh, staff and our colleges up and down the state, but I want to acknowledge specifically the members of the uh, Chancellor's Office staff and the foundation who put this event together. Uh, these events uh, don't happen by accident. They require a lot of hard work, and even when you do all that hard work, you can't plan for the power going off and the air conditioning with it. So we apologize if you're a little toasty, but uh, I think that uh, our honorees this morning uh, and our speaker will tell you that uh, sometimes the heat in the kitchen gets turned up pretty high. So acknowledge all the Chancellor's Office staff and Foundation folks who worked on this event. <clears throat> It's now my uh, extreme pleasure to introduce the Board of Governors uh, of California Community College's President Jeffrey Baum. He has a long and proud relationship with the California Community Colleges. Jeff has served for 12 years as a member of the Governing Board, and uh, he's been on the, he was on the Governing Board of the Pasadena Area Community College District for a dozen years and served two terms as their president. He works at the University of Southern California, where he is the Managing Director of the Center on Communications Leadership and Policy. He also served as director, serves as Director of Communication and Public Affairs for the Annenberg Foundation Trust at Sunnylands. His commitment and dedication to the California Community Colleges and the students of our great state is extraordinary, and it's certainly been a pleasure working alongside of him. Please welcome the President of the Board of Governors, Jeffrey Baum. Good morning. This is a fantastic day. This is actually one of the very best days in the service of any member of the Board of Governors, and I'm delighted to welcome the special guests who are here from the Governor's Office, representatives of the State Legislature, but also I'm very proud to be associated with this group of Board of Governors, and I want to give you a chance to uh, meet them individually, and if, if I can call on you to at, at least stand or wave to be acknowledged, uh, my colleagues on the Board of Governors. We've got Cecilia Estolano, our Vice President of the Board of Governors. Arnaldo Avalos. Joseph Belinsky. Where's Joseph? There's Joseph. Jo Jeff Burdick, our newest member of the Board of Governors. Uh, Connie Conway. Thomas Epstein. Where's Thomas? There he is. Danny Hawkins. Ravneet Kaur, Kaur, where's Ravneet? Uh, our student trustee, sleeping in. 
um, Je uh, Gary Reed, <laughs> Valerie Shaw, and Colonel Nancy Sumner. Did I catch everybody? Uh, do, oh, do we have any other? Anybody? Oh, there you are. I did, there's there's uh, member Kaur, Evne Kaur. This award is actually named for a former member of this board, and I want you to, uh, I wanted to share a little bit of background on Dr. John Rice, because it, to give you a perspective of why we're having this honor today. Dr. Rice was born in the segregated South in 1923. From those origins, he went on to become a minister and a university leader. He earned a history degree at Johnson C. Smith University and a divinity degree. He held numerous roles during his long career as an educator, coach, teacher, and counselor. He eventually became the dean of students at Stillman College. Stillman College, as you know, is one of the colleges, the HBCUs, which, with which we created a transfer pathway earlier this year that this Board of Governors was able to ratify. So. That's an exciting uh, uh, development in the past year. He later became a professor and assistant vice chancellor at the University of Denver in Colorado. At the behest of his daughter, former Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice, he moved to Palo Alto, California, where he held academic positions at Stanford University. And in 1989, he married Clara Bailey, whom, he deeply, he, whom we are deeply honored to have with us here this morning. Governor Pete Wilson appointed Dr. Rice to the Board of Governors of the California Community Colleges in 1993, where he served until his passing in 2000. Many of us here would not hold positions we do or have done great things that we had been not been inspired, had we not been inspired by someone else. That person may have been a parent, a spouse, or a teacher. For Dr. Rice, it was his father. He would say that his father was his greatest role model and that, he, was a, that it, he impressed upon him the importance of helping others. Dr. Rice took his father's lessons to heart. In his role as a member of the Board of Governors, he fought for policies that ensured Californians of all stripes could get the same opportunities to obtain an education that had catapulted him to such great heights. He was a leader, an innovator, an advocate for equal employment opportunity, and non-discrimination in the California Community College system. In 1950s Alabama, Dr. Rice was denied the right to vote. That denial of a basic right as a citizen, when combined with his father's counsel, must have served as a powerful catalyst for him to fight for the rights of others to be included in all institutions of our society. He wanted to live in a world of, in which people should never have to experience that same discrimination that he endured simply because of the color of his skin. It was a simple but powerful idea that resonates today here at the California Community Colleges. Dr. Rice wanted all community college students to be treated equally, fairly, and with respect, unlike how he had been treated. He was a great man, a man who demanded, was denied basic rights in the segregated, segregated South, and eventually went on to hold very distinguished positions at some of our nation's top universities a man who ra uh, raised the United States Secretary of State, and instead of turning against a system that rejected him, through hard work and a college education, he became part of it and labored mightily to ensure that it was inclusive and embraced diversity and equity. And so the Dr. John W. Rice Diversity and Equity Award was established to honor his legacy. We have recognized some remarkable individuals over the past 15 years. People who have founded programs that have given a diverse array of students a shot at academic and career success. People who have inspired young men and women to think for themselves and to reach for goals that they did not even know existed before they had set our foot on our campuses. An educator's calling is to impart wisdom and knowledge to his or her students. The best reward for an educator is to watch those students grow into better people because of what, they ha what has been learned inside and outside the classroom. It can be a difficult and even painful process, if all the faculty in the room understand that, but acquiring knowledge and the confidence and security that comes with it outranks the acquisition of almost any other material good. 
Dr. John W. Rice wanted everyone to get the chance to learn at a first-rate college because he knew that one difference could radically alter the trajectories of many families and their descendants. The winners today want the same thing for their students, and we are delighted to recognize their commitment, service, and achievement. And so now I want to uh, turn things back to Chancellor Harris. Thank you, and it, honestly, we're honored that you're here to join in this very special celebration. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, President Baum. And uh, I, again, want to express my sincere gratitude for the work of the Board of Governors. Uh, their uh, collective wisdom and guidance allow our colleges to provide a quality affordable education to millions of Californians. Um, a number of these board members uh, have joined us within the last uh, year and a half, and I can tell you this is probably the most exciting board the California Community Colleges have seen, certainly in the uh, more than 20 years I've been in this state, and it's the largest board we've had in uh, nearly two decades. So please, uh, again, join me in thanking the Board of Governors of the California Community Colleges. As you heard uh, President Baum say, we're here today to celebrate the legacy and the vision of Dr. John W. Rice and to present the Rice Award to Dr. Sharu K. Mystery of Butte College and Robin O'Connor of Orange Coast College. The winners were selected from a highly competitive field of nominees and it was quite reaffirming to hear about the many community college staff members working hard each day to ensure that our colleges remain reflective of California's diverse population and that we treat everyone with dignity, respect, and equality. The California Community College's mission is to provide a quality education to anyone in the state who has the ambition to earn one. And that can not only be a rewarding mission, but also a challenging one. Our state is large and diverse. Our campuses, like our state, are populated with people of different ethnicities, cultures, socioeconomic backgrounds, abilities, and who speak many different languages. I personally have found it tremendously enriching to be exposed to so many perspectives and believe that the diverse nature of our college system, state, and country is one of our major strengths. But diversity brings challenges. In several societies, diversity isn't welcomed or tolerated. It can be a cause of violence due to mistrust and paranoia and hatred of simple differences. And yet we see what happens when diversity is embraced in a society. The talents and skills of people are unleashed and humanity prospers. The key to unlocking and harnessing potential is an embrace of equality. Embracing equality can be difficult to be sure. It means having to look past superficial qualities and treating others fairly. Our own country has its own struggles with embracing the simple virtue. But slowly and surely, it has and will continue to do so. And as a society, we will be better for it. Liberating millions of people from slavery, extending the right to vote to women, passing the civil rights laws, enacting the Americans with Disabilities Act, and repealing laws that discriminate against gays and lesbians has, been, has taken all steps in the right direction. Progress came haltingly, but it came, and with it, suffering and prejudice were curbed, and human potential was unleashed. That is not to say that this country is a utopia. It is not. We still struggle with many things, but as a society, we set a powerful example to others in this world that great things can be accomplished through a national embrace of virtues, equality, diversity, and education. So the California Community Colleges have a prominent role to play in this country and in this state as we prosper. We have the complex task of providing an education to millions of people each year with differing backgrounds. This is the mission with which we have been charged. It certainly can be difficult to provide an excellent education to so many people to ensure that they succeed, and yet I think we're doing just that. It helps that our colleges cover the state. There are now 113 community colleges in California. Chances are a community college is located down the street from the recent high school graduate who wants to earn a degree or certificate or the man or woman in town who wants to go back to school and get a second chance to turn their lives around. 
the California community colleges have always been up to the challenge of meeting these demands, of preparing a new generation to achieve great things, but serving so many people means we have to find creative ways of attracting, retaining, and graduating student. The winners of this award today show us just how to do that. One of those uh, winners, Dr. Mystery, has helped to create a campus environment at Butte College that welcomes people of different backgrounds. He has helped the Butte College community learn about other cultures and expand their knowledge of the world. His efforts have paid off with surveys indicating that Butte College is a highly tolerant campus. Oftentimes, fear of the unknown can prevent prospective students from setting foot on a college campus. However, people like Dr. Mystery can help alleviate much of this fear by creating friendly and welcoming campuses. Professor Robin O'Connor is also doing her part to create a diverse and welcoming campus at Orange Coast College. She works in a kinesiology program to help disabled students improve their physical strength through exercise. She recruits volunteers to help her students with their exercise regimen. This reduces barriers between her students and the volunteers and eliminates stereotypes about physically disabled. Like Dr. Mystery, Professor O'Connor has done much to improve diversity and equity at Orange Coast, and we are proud of the work they have both done on behalf of our students. Today's winners responded to some of the challenges we face as educators in some innovative and successful ways. They've developed programs and hosted events that have enabled students of diverse backgrounds to succeed. There are plenty of innovative programs that the California Community Colleges system are developing that will certainly contribute to the success of students from all backgrounds in California. Expanding access to quality, affordable education benefits everyone. My strong belief is that our citizens have the ability to learn and grow if only given access to outstanding educational institutions. Our California community colleges offer students a tremendous education, one within grasp of a vast segment of our population. Dr. Rice was a visionary leader. He saw a growing state with millions of people, some of them very new to this country. Would we expand or deny access for these people of our institution, to our institutions of public learning? Dr. Rice chose a wise course, yet the hardest one, and fought to keep the California Community Colleges as accessible as possible to anyone who wanted an education. He fought for inclusion, for access, for equity, and for diversity. History has shown that when societies include all members of their communities in their institutions, everyone benefits, and when societies don't, they suffer and decline. Recent events in our own country and across the globe have shown us what happens when equality and diversity are shunned and rejected. People suffer, ignorance and hate take root. Dr. Rice knew through his own personal experience that diversity, equity and education were the best weapons against prejudice, ignorance and suffering and that the California community colleges were uniquely positioned to fight these social ills. And so judging by today's winners, I think California's community colleges are doing their part to ensure that our citizens have access to the wonderful gift of higher education. Dr. Rice would be happy to know that his legacy lives on. And now it's really a pleasure for me to introduce uh, one of the uh, young and tenure members of the board, but someone who rose to leadership very quickly. Uh, a passionate leader uh, from Southern California who now uh, serves as of January as the Vice President of the Board of Governors. Please welcome Cecilia V. Estolano. Good morning. It's a beautiful morning. Um, breakfast was delicious. We've heard already about the amazing service of our educators in Orange Coast Col College and, and Butte. It's really a, a very inspiring morning. Actually, this is my favorite event in the, in the time I've served on the Board of Governors. This is really one of the most inspirational events we get to do all year. So I want to take just a few moments to talk about the community colleges and the students, right? This is why we do what we do the students. We have to always keep in mind why we're here and remember the stories, right? So the wonderful thing about the California Community Colleges, in my mind, it represents the best part of our state and of our country, and that is a place where if you want to better yourselves, if you want to get a good education, it's open to all. 
and your ambition can be satisfied. The doors are wide open, and it really represents the best in our state. Um, you only have to have the desire and the dedication, and you can improve your life and your life chances. So I want to talk about one of our students to kind of focus our mind. I want to tell you a story about a young woman named Genesis Garcia. Um, when Genesis was 11 years old, she left Guatemala after she had been in a car accident that killed her father. She joined her mother, who'd come to Los Angeles before her, but right before they were able to reunite, her mother was killed in a car accident. So um, Genesis lived with an uncle, and she spoke very little English um, before she entered school. But after earning a 4.0 GPA in high school, uh, Genesis enrolled in Santa Monica College. Um, in her first semester, a counselor said to her, write down the name of the schools that you want to go to. Where do you, where do you want to go? Where do you want to transfer? And so she wrote down UC Berkeley. And then she saw that I just, that was just a joke. I'm not going to do, you know, it's just a joke. I'm not going to get to UC Berkeley. But a counselor told her, no, that dream is going to become a reality. And sure enough, Genesis graduated with a 3.9 GPA. And this fall, she's going to be attending UC Berkeley. So. These are our students, right? These represent the dreamers. These represent the optimists, the hardworking people that have made this state great and this country great. Um, this is what we are opening up the doors to, folks like Genesis, dreamers, people who need a second chance in life, workers who need to get new skills and technologies to improve their life chances, to get a better job, immigrants looking to learn English who can navigate their way better in their surroundings. So we offer the key to prosperity by opening up opportunities for the mind. Um, so it's really important today when we celebrate diversity, we are blessed here in California to have such a diverse population with so many stories like Genesis, and we're blessed to be a part of an institution, a system that makes those stories and those dreams come true. So with that, I wanna thank you for being with us this morning, and it is my great pleasure to introduce my seatmate, Clara Rice. Good morning. It's not just old age that I can't get out, but I had a total knee replacement that I'm recuperating from. <laughs> you know, I say this every year over and over again because it's true. It's a pleasure and honor and a blessing to be here once again in the celebration of my late husband's Diversity and Equity Award ceremony. It is almost inconceivable that this ceremony has continued for 15 years since 2001. I remember that it got started very small, I think it was in the boardroom, but it has gotten larger and better each year. And I want to acknowledge and thank key people who have made all of this possible. The president of the Board of Governors, Jeffrey Baum, Baum, President, Vice President Cecilia Estolano, Chancellor Bryce Harris, and the President of the Foundation for California Community Colleges, Keitha Mills. Thanks, Keitha. Without the funds, none of this would be possible, not even the good breakfast that we had this morning. God bless you. <laughs> I would like to thank the Communication Division, the Rice Award Committee. I'm not sure who's all on that committee, but I'm almost sure that Paige Door is the leader. <laughs> this lady is a firecracker. As long as I've known her, she knows how to put things together and make them work. And I also want to thank Jonathan Calabretta, who is my personal contact person. He contacted me months ago and has kept me abreast of what, when, and where. He is almost as good as Tosh, who was my contact person from the beginning uh, until he retired a few years ago. Is Tosh in the building? He's not here this year. And I want to thank everyone here, the cooks, the musicians, the volunteers, and our speaker today, Commander Zoe Dunning, and this lovely audience. 
My stepdaughter, Condoleezza Rice, was unable to make it this year, but I did bring some of my family members, my son, Greg, my daughter-in-law, Victoria, and my grandson, Christian. I think I might have mentioned this before. John had one child, a daughter. I had one child, a son. So before um, we got married, I think this is the way he was proposing to me. He said, why don't you give me a son that I have always wanted, and I'll give you the daughter that you have always wanted. <laughs> it was a deal, so we married. <laughs> It was just the four of us in the wedding. Condi was my maid of honor, and Greg was John's best man. Um, for a long time, it was just the four of us. He didn't live long enough to see the family growing, thanks to Greg, because Condi told us it wasn't going to happen with her. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of Condi, I always like to tell a little something about John uh, with a little humor so that you would begin to know what he was like uh, more on a personal basis. John was the type of husband that wanted to be right by my side no matter what, where, everywhere I went, he wanted to be right there. I almost got in trouble once when I told him that I needed some space. But anyway, the story goes that uh, kind of John and I would go to Stanford basketball games and we would all sit together uh, but when football came, being the provost, they had a box that she could sit in with a guest. Now, uh, when we got there, Condi told John, now, you and I will sit in the box, and Clara, Lori, and Randy are going to sit on the bleachers. And John said in his booming voice, oh, no, my wife is going to sit with me, and I am not sitting on those bleachers. So Cundy had to sit on the bleachers with her, <laughs> with her friends, and John and I sat in the box. I really adore that man. <laughs> he was one who would always speak his mind no matter who it was. Sometimes I think he's between uh, Martin Luther King and Malcolm X. He's not as passive as Martin Luther King, and he's not as aggressive as Malcolm X, but he will tell you and anyone exactly what's on his mind. Now this brings me back to where we, why we are here, and that is to acknowledge the 2015 awards winner. I congratulate Dr. Shahrukh K, uh, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, Mystery from Butte, Co uh, Butte College. And I want to thank them for the hard work of forming committees, workshops, and conferences to promote diversity and equity on their campus, and I can't wait to hear more about this. And also to Professor Robin A. O'Connor from Orange Coast College, I want to thank them for being an advocate for students with physical and mental disabilities on their campus. What a great way to show diversity and equality for all students. And I'm waiting to hear more for them. So I'm not the speaker this morning. I'm going to take my seat and let the great speaker come up. But again, I want to thank all of you who had a part in making this day possible. And may God continue to bless each of you. Thank you. Thank you again, Mrs. Rice. Uh, you know, this uh, activity uh, wouldn't be what it is without Mrs. Rice's attendance every year. Please uh, give her another round of applause. <laughs> it's now my uh, distinct uh, pleasure to introduce the uh, main event today, the uh, retired U.S. Navy Commander Zoe Dunning. Commander Dunning has been a fierce national champion for equity. She graduated from the United States Naval Academy in Annapolis, one of the earliest classes that included women. After completing six years of active duty service, she transitioned to the Navy Reserves so she could attend Stanford's Graduate School of Business. 
In January of 1993, while still a student at Stanford, she courageously and publicly came out as a lesbian in protest of the ban on gay service in the United States military. One of the first military members to be prosecuted under the Don't Ask, Don't Tell law, Zoe successfully won her discharge hearing and continued to serve as the only openly gay member of the U.S. military for, 13, for the next 13 years. Not satisfied with protecting just her military career, she continued her advocacy by leading the Service Members Legal Defense Network as a national nonprofit dedicated to providing legal services to those impacted by the law as its governing board co-chair. She retired as a U.S. Navy commander after 22 years of service to our country. President Barack Obama honored Commander Dunning for her successful 18-year battle fighting for equality in the armed forces by asking her to stand next to him when he signed the historic Don't Ask, Don't Tell Repeal Act of 2010. Now, an interesting note, her wife Pam incidentally happens to be one of our colleagues at Foothill De Anza College, so Commander Dunning is a proud extended member of our community college family. Please join me in welcoming Commander Dunning. Good morning, thank you. Let's get my iPad to rotate. All right, we'll do it that way. Um, and get the timer started, because I want to be on time, because I'm a military gal. All right. Uh, um, first of all, thank you very much for the, um, the opportunity to speak here, and thank you for the very warm introduction. Um, everyone's been very kind and introduced themselves. Um, I'm grateful to be wearing the lapel pin of Dr. Uh, excuse me, Colonel Nancy Sumner, who gave me her um, Women Who Serve lapel pin today, so I'm wearing it proudly. Um, I'd like to acknowledge all of the veterans uh, in the audience today who have served their country in uniform. Would you mind standing, please? Um, I get the opportunity to speak at a lot of different events to a lot of different audiences, um, but to speak in front of this audience around the California Community Colleges is truly an honor and very exciting. Um, my family has, been, uh, has benefited from community colleges. My older sister, Ruth, went back to school in her 40s and went to a community college in Savannah, Georgia, continued her education, and at the age of 54, graduated from University of Georgia's Veterinary School of Medicine and is now a doctor of veterinary medicine in the Bay Area. Um, also, my wife Pam not only works at Foothill De Anza, but she joined the Navy shortly after high school, did not go to college immediately, and went back to school as an adult at Chabot College, got her AA, went on to get her bachelor's, went on to get her MBA, and is now the director of purchasing at Foothill De Anza Community College. Um, she has a 45-mile commute from San Francisco each way down to Foothill De Anza, but nearly every single day she comes home and tells me, I love my job. Um, I joined the military for some of the same reasons that a lot of people join the military. Um, tradition. Both of my parents served during World War II. Um, my father was in the Army Air Corps, and my mother was actually in the second class of women to go through officer candidate school in Fort Des Moines, Iowa in 1942. Uh, also, finances played a role. I was the youngest of seven children. There was no money left for college. I was looking for a scholarship opportunity, and after I'd met a gal who had just finished her plea year at West Point, the idea of going to a service academy sounded very intriguing, both for the education, the leadership development, but also the free tuition. Um, when I entered the Naval Academy, the very first class of women had just graduated in 1980. I entered in 1981. This is where you get the difference between tolerance and welcoming environments. We were tolerated there because Congress told them that we had to be there. It was not welcoming in any way, shape, or form. Men outnumbered women 13 to 1. Women were 7% of the, my class. I graduated in a class that had 1,000 men and 70 women. I graduated in 1985. President Reagan spoke at my, retire at my uh, graduation ceremony. It was very difficult being a woman at the Naval Academy, but I also realized while I was there that I was lesbian. And I also realized very quickly that if anyone found out, I would lose my scholarship, that I would lose my college education, 
And so I had to keep it very deeply hidden. And this to me was very conflicting because I joined the military because of the values that the military espouses. It's about integrity, it's about honor, it's about commitment. And here I had to lie about who I was every day in order to continue to serve my country. I had to live a double life. I had to worry every single day whether that was the day that I would get a memo, because this is before email, um, that I would get a memo that said the commanding officer needs to see you now and think that that was the day that I was found out and that I was going to get kicked out of the military. That was one of the reasons I decided to leave active duty, was living that day in and day out fear. I thought the reserves would be better, I could have a, you know, go, go to school, eventually have a civilian career job, and just pretend on the weekends when I did my reserve duty. But even that was too much. And while I was a student at Stanford Business School, Clinton announced that he was going to repeal Don't Ask, Don't Tell. And he started to renege on his campaign promise. And so there was a rally outside of Moffett Naval Air Station in Mountain View. And at the rally, it was, the whole purpose was to encourage Clinton four days before his inauguration to do the right thing and lift the ban on gays in the military. I was asked to speak at it. And at first I said, no way, like, you know, I'm not doing that. I'm even afraid to be seen in the audience. But the offer to speak kept going over and over in my head and the speech just formed itself in my head. What would I say if I could? Because what was so frustrating at that time is that in the national debate, everyone was talking about gays in the military. Everyone had an opinion. And the only ones who couldn't speak up were those who were actually impacted by it. Those who were actually gay and lesbian, bisexual in the military, were not allowed to speak in this debate. And so part of my reasoning for stepping up was the values I learned in the military is about speaking out, it's about leadership. And so I decided to come out publicly to give a voice to those who had no voice. I was also frustrated that much of the national debate was on the news all about men and showers and showers and men, 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 showers, showers, men, men, showers, men. <laughs> it's really all they cared about. Um, and I thought to myself, the lesbians must be dry cleaned because they are never talking about the women. And so I wanted to bring a woman's voice to the issue. And when I first came out, my shipmates in my reserve unit didn't understand. They thought that I was trying to shame the military. And what I tried to express to them is I'm not shaming the military, I am trying to shame a policy that is harming the military. I'm trying to bring light to the fact that this policy keeps very committed, articulate, competent people from serving in the military. And that makes our military less strong if you keep them from serving. So I kept on with this. I had a discharge hearing. This was under the policy prior to Don't Ask, Don't Tell, because I came out before Clinton took office. And at the hearing, they had voted unanimously to kick me out. What happened, though, was that three weeks later, after my hearing, Clinton announced Don't Ask, Don't Tell. And they weren't sure what to do with me. They were like, well, heck, we just you know, convicted her of violating a policy that's now being supplanted by a new one. What do we do? So we're like, well, that was so much fun. Let's do it again. Um, and so I was notified that I would have a second discharge hearing, this one under Don't Ask, Don't Tell, and I'd get another chance. So during this 18 months between my two discharge hearings, I continued to serve um, alongside my shipmates every, you know, every weekend, and they became more and more accepting. We had one-on-one -on -one conversations. And what was also ironic was that four weeks before my second discharge hearing, I received notification that I'd been selected for promotion to lieutenant commander. <laughs> so on the one hand, the military was trying to kick me out, and on the other hand, they were like, oh, you're great, we're gonna promote you. So during this time, I was working as a management consultant after I graduated from Stanford Business School. And you get assigned to projects that range anywhere from you know, four weeks to a year um, with different clients, and you get assigned to different teammates on your consulting team that go out and do the, um, do the consulting. And so I was assigned to a project for a client in the Bay Area, and my project manager would be this guy named Ross. Now Ross was from our Portland office, and when we showed up for our first client meeting together, the receptionist, this was right after my first discharge hearing, and the receptionist recognized my name and just went on and on for a good minute about, oh, Zoe Dunning, oh my God, thank you so much for everything you've done, you're fabulous, um, you know, I can't thank you enough, you're so brave and courageous, thank you so much. You know, John, you know, Mr. Williams will see you now. And my colleague Ross, who had been in Portland and was clueless what had happened, was like, what was that all about? I was like, I'll tell you later. Um, so it was in the elevator ride down from this meeting that I came out to Ross 
and told him what that was all about. Well, I also came to find out that Ross is a devout Mormon and that we would be working side by side, traveling together, working late nights together for the next two months. And so began the education of Ross. <laughs> we spent many meals, drives, airplane rides, sharing our personal lives and getting to know one another. It was actually a safe zone to ask questions. He knew nothing about being LGBT. I knew nothing about the Church of Latter-day Saints. I would ask, what would he do if one of his daughters came out to him as lesbian? He insisted, that could not happen. He asked me in relationships whether I was the boy or the girl. I asked him, what's up with that underwear? <laughs> but we were allowed to ask politically incorrect questions of one another because we'd established a relationship and we really truly had curiosity about each other's lives. We became very close. I admired how committed he was to his family, I could not you know, send him emails or work with him on Sundays. It was totally committed to, to his family, and I really admired that. So when the project ended, I and my legal team were in final preparations for my second discharge hearing. And the evening before my hearing, I returned home, and there was a bouquet of flowers on my doorstep. It was an unusual arrangement. It was a dozen red roses, but in the middle was a solitary yellow rose. I had no idea who had sent this. I quickly and excitedly opened up the card, and I read the card, and the card read, some might fail to see the beauty of the yellow rose and remove it from the bunch. Good luck tomorrow. Best wishes, Ross. I won that second discharge hearing. I was one of the very first under Don't Ask, Don't Tell to win a hearing. Um, I won't go into the legal details of how that happened, I think there was just confusion overall, how do one prosecutes or defends these cases, but I was allowed to continue serving. And I continued serving openly for 13 years until I retired as a commander in 2006. During this time, I got involved with Service Members Legal Defense Network. It was a national nonprofit based in DC that was like the 911. If you are on a ship in um, Sicily and you come home, come back to your rack in your birthing after the mid-watch and someone has spray painted faggot, on your bed, where do you turn, what do you do? You're afraid to notify your command because they might actually start an investigation as to why someone would spray paint that on your rack as opposed to figuring out who spray painted it. So we were like the 911 that people could call if they were being investigated or wanted to come out safely or um, just wanted to know what their rights were. So we worked on that and we also worked to lobby on Capitol Hill to overturn the policy. And this was during the Bush administration. This was laying the groundwork and we knew it was not necessarily going to happen in the near term, but we were laying the foundation for when the opportunity would come. And the opportunity did come when we felt when Obama became elected. So we doubled down on our efforts on Capitol Hill. We did a lot of lobbying and we knew that we had turned the corner. If any of you have read, you know, the tipping point, um, they, you know, they talk about that moment in time when all of a sudden things change. And for us, things changed when Admiral Mike Mullen testified before Congress that the don't ask, don't tell policy was a stain on the military and that it was an affront not only to the integrity of the individuals, but it was an affront to the integrity of the institution. And when I watched that, tears rolled down my face because I knew that we had hit that tipping point. I knew that from here on out, it was going to happen. I knew that we had the senior most uniformed military member saying that this was important to the military. So, when it did get passed by the Senate, I received a notification and an invitation to come to the signing ceremony in Washington, D.C. And I was just so amazed. And, and the first thing I did was I called my hairstylist. <laughs> and I said, I know your salon's not open on Sunday or Monday, but I have to leave on a red eye Monday night for the signing ceremony. And he said, I'll get you in. So when I arrived, they notified me that not only was I going to attend the signing ceremony, it wasn't until after I arrived that they notified me that I was actually one of two veterans that were gonna be on stage with the president when he signed the bill. So I was really glad that I got my hair done. Um, <laughs> it was truly an honor. I couldn't believe that it was happening. Um, you know, I, I was up on stage like this and I wasn't sure what to do with my hands or what to do and there was a crowd, an audience of like 300 people in the auditorium and just tears of laughter and tears of joy and tears of relief for people who had been kicked out, people who had worked on this issue, congressional staffers, everyone. And I got the benefit of seeing all of their faces, but I didn't know what to do with my hands. And um, so I thought to myself, WWND, what would Nancy do? So I look over at Nancy Pelosi. 
and I see that she has what I'll refer to as the prayerful fig leaf. <laughs> so I too assume the prayerful fig leaf position <laughs> up on stage. And the, the president gives a very moving, wonderful speech. He invites me over next to his desk. I'm, I'm about this far from the desk as he's signing it. And, um, and for any of you who've been to a bill signing ceremony, I know many of you here have, they use many pens to sign your name once because they hand the pens out as souvenirs. And so it takes a really long time to sign the bill. He had 13 pens to sign his name once. So he takes one pen and he does the back of the B and he puts the pen down, he takes another pen and he finishes the B and he puts that down and he gets another pen and he does the A on and on and on. And I'm standing next to him trying to like, you know, look good and put my hands in the right place. And I'm just so excited and I've been working on this for 18 years, 18 years. And this is, rarely do you work on an issue, whether it's education or whether it's healthcare or anything, rarely do you have this seminal moment that is so clear that you have had victory. And I was thinking, and I got a little paranoid over the 18 years because you'd have a victory and then you'd have a defeat and then you'd have a victory and you'd have a defeat. And here we were, it was actually happening. I thought to myself, what could go wrong now? And as he's signing his name, I just said, Make sure you spell it right. <laughs> In my outside voice, to the President of the United States. Um, thankfully, he has a sense of humor, and uh, he laughed, and the Secret Service did not tackle me and remove me from the stage. Um, it was just one of the most amazing moments, like I said, really do you have something that is that clear. And I do believe that the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell paved the way for all of the victories that we are experiencing now for the LGBT community, um, whether it be marriage equality, transgender military service, the military just announced that they're looking at uh, lifting the ban on transgender military service. We recently had an announcement that Boy Scout leaders um, could be LGBT. Um, and so every time you tear down a wall of discrimination, the house starts to crumble and you start to see the other uh, walls come down. So I say that as sort of an inspiration of like, you never know what difference you can make. I was a second year business school student at Stanford. I was 29 years old. I saw something that I felt was wrong and I decided to speak up and do something about it. And I'd like to think that I've had some small part in what we're experiencing and, and the benefits that we're having today. So I took on the military. Perhaps you might want to start with something smaller. Um, <laughs> But I encourage you, if you see a wrong and you want to do something right about it, step forward. You're not, you, don't, you have no idea where it's going to take you. I had no idea it would take me on stage with the President of the United States, but it did. You just have to keep believing, keep working hard. I was using all the qualities that the military had taught me about leadership, honor, courage, commitment, integrity, and speaking up and doing the right thing. So today's awards are all about continuing that trajectory for the community colleges to address stereotypes, educate, create a welcoming and inclusive environment. Your awards state that they're about diversity and equity. And my wife and I had this conversation about what's the difference between equality and equity. And we you know, recognize that when you look up the definition, it all talks about being just and fair or justice and fairness. And it differs from equality in that what is just and fair for one person or group may not necessarily be fair for another. And so back to the Rose story and Ross. A dozen red roses would be nice, but frankly, a little boring. You add the yellow rose, it makes it a little more interesting. Add some baby's breath, maybe some carnations, and it's a lot more vibrant. Look at the flower displays on your table there. Look how beautiful they are with all the diversity of colors and the different types of flowers. It's not easy to grow different flowers. Each flower needs different types of sunlight, might need different watering instructions, might need different types of soil and food. It's a lot more work. But it, let's not kid ourselves. Diversity, creating an equitable environment, it's a lot of work. It's not easy. But the end result is definitely worth it. We don't want the yellow rose to feel alone. We want the yellow rose to feel welcome. So the work that you're doing and our awardees do every single day helps to make everyone in California feel welcome to pursue an affordable, quality education. Thank you for the work you do, and thank you for the opportunity to be with you here this morning.
Well, that's not enough. Commander Zoe Dunning, one more round of applause. The uh, Board of Governors established the Dr. John W. Rice Diversity and Equity Award 15 years ago, a few months after Dr. Rice passed away. This award recognizes a community college staff member or program that has made a significant contribution toward faculty and staff diversity or student equity. Nomination forms are sent by the colleges to our office every spring and a panel of volunteer readers from the Chancellor's Office is assembled to go through the nominations and select the winners. There were a number of nominations, tremendous ones this year, but two were selected and it's a pleasure first to ask Dr. Uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, Shoru K. Mystery from Butte College to please come to the podium and accept the John W. Rice Award. Chancellor Harris, members of the Board of Governors, Rice family, and distinguished guests. I'm truly honored to be here today on behalf of Butte College, its faculty, staff, and students. We're here this morning to recognize the value of diversity, but I have to admit that there's one particular aspect of me that's rather devoid of diversity. Um, in my entire life, I have never been away from a college campus. And I have my parents to blame and thank for that. As a child of two university professors and later administrators, I grew up on a college campus. I found the intellectual stimulation of academic life fascinating, and I've never thought twice about being anything other than a professor. To quote the Sufi poet Rumi, let the beauty of what you love be what you do. Some of my fondest memories growing up in this academic environment were the evening activities at our home. My parents created an open space for dialogue that invariably saw numerous students from various disciplines, engineers, journalists, economists, political scientists, and more, come to our home in the evening to discuss issues ranging from child development to Shakespeare, from campus politics to international politics. As a child, this melting pot of ideas and people so excited to discuss them filled me with awe. It wasn't until much later that I realized the importance that this exposure to a diverse set of philosophies had on my growth and my intellectual curiosity. To my parents, I will forever be grateful. At Butte College, we recognize this importance that exposure to ideas, especially ideas outside of the norm, has for our students. The diversity committee has been instrumental in creating an environment that fosters inclusion while also expanding horizons. For example, each spring we organize a week of talks, movies, art, and discussions to focus on issues relating to diversity and equity. Recent invited keynote speakers have discussed autism, bipolar disorder, being an Iranian Muslim in the US, poetry of war, gender violence, and much more. Over a thousand individuals attend these events each year, the vast majority of them students. But it is not just the invited speakers that makes Diversity Day so successful. Our faculty, staff, and students present as well on issues ranging from the new Jim Crow, the power of language in the LGBT community, classical Thai dance, and rethinking race and gender blindness. If we truly seek diversity, we must ask ourselves what makes us uncomfortable and then strive to incorporate that into our daily lives. That is what Diversity Days does, not just for our students at Butte, but for the entire campus. One's achievement is a testament to those who precede and those who surround. I am but a face to the institute and people who have and do make diversity and inclusion key parts of Butte College. Our college recognizes diversity as a core value for the institute. This award reflects the support for diversity initiatives on campus from the administration, our past president, Dr. Perry, 
current interim president, Dr. Yacoub, vice presidents, Al Renville, Les Jerome, David Danielson, and Dean Peggy Jennings Severe. Faculty and staff, including Aisha Taskarin, Laura Raposo Davis, Yvette Zuniga, and many, many others. Support from these individuals, as well as the associated students and incredible students like Giovanna Vera, make the work that I do so pleasurable and memorable. Finally, I love to cook. And it's vital when cooking to know when to stir and when to let things simmer on their own. Okay. Sometimes all it takes is the addition of a few spices and a little mixing for the flavors to come together and produce a wonderful dish with emergent properties. Our community college campuses are undeniably a melting pot. Let's add some masala and stir. <laughs> Thank you, and please join me in welcoming diversity committee member and past Associated Students President Giovanna Vera. Hello everyone, my name is Giovanna Vera and I'm a former student of Butte College and I'm here to talk about the positive influence Dr. Shrook Mystery had on my life. However, in order to understand the impact Dr. Shrook Mystery and the Butte College Diversity Committee had on me, it is important to first understand my background and my future goals. I come from a low-income family. My mother was a teen mom and my dad a college dropout. In order to seek a better future for the three children, my parents brought us to the United States in pursuit for that ever popular American dream. I know some of you may be curious, so let me just go ahead and say that yes, we are all undocumented. Flash forward 15 years and I'm getting ready to graduate high school. My older sister was starting a family, my older brother had passed away in a tragic car accident, and there was now a little sister in the mix. The pressure was on. The pressure to graduate college, earn a, earn a degree, start a great career, and be able to provide for my parents who were quickly approaching retirement. Fortunately, I was a 4.29 GPA student who had earned the title of valedictorian of my high school graduating class. At that time, deferred action and the California Dream Act were just that, a dream. I couldn't work legally and didn't receive any sort of financial aid. I only had a handful of scholarships, yet I decided to be ambitious and go to Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. After only a year of attending, I was forced to take an educational leave because I just couldn't afford it anymore. That's when I had first felt my voice silenced. The following semesters, one of my uncles encouraged me to go to Butte College. In the meantime, since it was more affordable, he agreed to house me free of charge while I sold tamales to earn a living and pay for school expenses. I now hate tamales. <laughs> I can honestly say this is probably the most confusing time of my life because I felt like an outcast in the country that I had called home most of my life. Confusing because I did not know which culture I belonged to or what the word culture necessarily meant. In all honesty, I wanted to give up. It was then that I decided to apply for the Butte College Associated Students Cultural Affairs Director in hopes of finding meaning in my life and being able to define culture for the first time. I was appointed and attended the Butte College Diversity Committee meetings, um, and that's when I first met Dr. Shrook Mystery and the rest of the Diversity Committee. We spent most of the semester finalizing plans for the Butte College Diversity Days, a week full of meaningful and insightful performances, workshops, keynote speakers, and more that focus on diversity and equity. The diversity committee led by Sharuk allowed me to say and do what I felt was right and they never judged or lost faith in me. It was around this time that I had heard a quote that definitely touched me and set up, summed up my experience as a cultural affairs director. Gandhi said, a nation's culture resides in the hearts and in the soul of its people. In this case, nation being Butte College and its people being people like you, Sharuk. After my first semester in student government and my experiences with Sharuk and the diversity committee, I was now on a mission to ensure that no student voice was ever silenced like mine had been. Meanwhile, my work on the committee caught the attention of the director of orientation at Butte College and I got my first job ever, legally, let me add, um, as a Butte College orientation leader. I became and remained an orientation leader for two years and served a term as the AS vice president. Then I ran and won for the position of AS president. 
During these past two years, I was a mentor and a friend to over a thousand incoming students and had seated and helped seat 20 students on over 30 decision-making committees campus-wide each semester. Now, I am transferring to Chico State University in the fall in hopes of completing my degree in civil engineering with the focus on water resources, hydrology, and sustainability. Sharuk, I couldn't have done any of this without you. When I first joined the diversity committee, our main focus was diversity days. After two and a half years, it has been an honor to see you lead the committee in tackling different diversity and equity issues on campus, such as creating gender, gender neutral bathrooms, efforts in creating a diversity center at Butte College, and striving for equal employment opportunities for faculty and staff. I can only imagine how many students have been posi positively affected from all the work that you've done. Butte provided me with a second chance and the ability to learn in an inclusive environment. Because I know Sharuk had a huge part to do with this, he has inspired me to return to a community college after I have resolved the world's water issues and teach. Thank you from the bottom of my heart for being a truly amazing person, for saving me for myself and saving my family. Thank you. So it's a pleasure to uh, present our final award today to Professor Robin O'Connor of Orange Coast College for her work with the physically disabled students. Robin? Since I got scolded about my hands yesterday, I think I should be doing this too. <laughs> you try. I am sincerely humbled and honored to receive this award on behalf of Orange Coast College, our adopted kinesiology program, and our amazing students. Adapted kinesiology used to be called adapted PE. Some of you might know more by that name. We've aligned ourselves with the uh, CSUs on that number. I don't come here by myself. I didn't start this program. This program was started over 40 years ago. The first person to do it was Leon Ski, who just retired in the spring after 42 years of service. Um, Leon was my mentor and my teacher throughout my school at Orange Coast. Um, also, Mary Martin, I'd like to acknowledge her. She was before me with 11 years of service. We don't come to this by ourselves. People before us, people ahead of us, I stand on the shoulders of giants. Throughout the years that I've been at Orange Coast and before that, when the program was for the 40 years, we've gone through um, or brought ahead so many students, students that were in our programs and then the students who assist in our programs. In my time alone, I calculated at more than 3,000 assistants. So kids who have come through from biology or from just being on the campus and wanting to volunteer. So the kids really benefit from this, and I uh, really appreciate it. And I'd like to introduce you to a couple of those students, because I think it's always more important to get the individual studies. An avid drummer, Jason, was chilling with his band at his parents' home, which happens to back onto uh, the 405, if you know that area in Southern California. Upon hearing a loud crash from the freeway, he and his friends ran to see if they could help out. Keith placed his hands on the top of the fence to leap over to the road, and landed very wrong. When he awoke from his coma, he was a paraplegic. His brain still very much intact. He was bored. He was angry. 
depressed, and dependent on his parents or a caregiver for his every need, eating, toileting, bathing. He was encouraged, okay, maybe, maybe a little bit pushed by his mom, to take an adaptive kinesiology class at OCC. There he found a safe home and a direction. He's married now to his sweetheart. He's bright, articulate, has a wicked, wonderful sense of humor. He utilized the OCC campus support programs through GSPS and is transferring to Cal State Long Beach, go beach, to further his psychology and political science career. Alejandra is a responsible young Latina who has been an assistant in adaptive kinesiology for years and my personal friend. She also happens to be a dreamer, now with legal status, who is determined to be a physician's assistant. She is unswerving in her commitment to our students with disability, our program, and OCC. She's the eldest. She works two jobs. She also, I just learned, volunteers at Santa Ana College with other dreamers. Uh, she cares for two younger siblings, one of whom has autism, and struggles to keep up with the demands of her academics in a chaotic, economically challenged home environment. Alejandra is tough. But after so many years spent hiding in the shadows, OCC and adaptive kinesiology gave her a safe place to learn and to grow. She's transferring to Cal State Long Beach to finish off her bachelor's degree and get all her prerequisites for the University of California's Physician's Assistant Program. Robert, an African-American wheelchair user whose twisted leg and back were the result of a tragic car accident that killed his best friend. At 19, he was living in a one-room apartment with his single teacher, mom. He enrolled in our adaptive kinesiology classes to improve his strength and mobility to handle his academic load. He was doing well. He came to me a couple weeks into this third semester, exhausted and numb with shock. The night before, his mother had had a massive heart attack, and she died in his arms. He then struggled to stay in school, to stay on top of the legal and financial issues. He became homeless, lived out of his truck, showering in the OCC's locker room before attending his academic classes. Fortunately for all of us, his story has a good ending. He fought hard to resurface. He utilized several of OCC's support programs, including adaptive kinesiology, and finally graduated from OCC. He's now a working actor, and even better, he's learned to walk again. These stories are not unique, and these are not just my students. They're our students. And we collectively are entrusted to champion their right to safe access to a decent education. You've heard it from all of the other speakers. I think we can do a better job. I'm kind of with Zoe on this, job, this part. We can do better. Ethnically and culturally diverse, physically, economically, and socially challenged, bright, intelligent, directed, empathetic, gay, transgender, male, female, and all with the potential to be superheroes. Change the world, make their mark become amazing citizens. They come to us just as they are, and it's up to us to listen to their needs and implement appropriate solutions. I'm reminded of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation tagline that I hear on NPR all the time. We seek to unlock the possibility in each individual. I think our community colleges can do that. I always say that everyone has a disability, some more visible than others. The degree of access to positive, inclusive support systems and programs on our college campuses will determine success or failure. I'd like to share with my check, or you with my checklist. This is what my personal, this is what I'm aiming for, to be a rabid ally in the constant pursuit of equity and diversity. A rabid one, I like that word. To act as passionate leaders in the context of this pursuit. Work effectively in our campus groups and diversity committees. Educate, communicate, advocate for our students on is issues of equality and diversity. Utilize every opportunity to promote universal design concepts. This is extremely important in my world. Access, inclusion, respect and honor our veterans and issues that they face. Challenge stereotypes, every stereotype, race, sexual orientation, religion, creed, color, privilege. Make the case for women's equity. Work to understand disability and the impact of advancing access. Learn about our GLBTQ communities and their identities. We must own our attitudes, our way of doing things, 
Our policies, procedures, decisions must be made with foresight, not hindsight. As Dr. Rice passionately fought for equity and diversity in education, we must fight on all of our campuses to develop and preserve a climate that is inclusive, safe, and favorable to the development of human potential of all faculty, staff, administrators, and students. We're on the right path with programs such as OCC's Adaptive Kinesiology, and we do a pretty fine job. Through the support of similar programs across the state, we will be con continue to do better for all of our students. Now I'd like to introduce you to my amazing student, who has agreed to share her very own special story. Please help me welcome Julie Ferris. I was 19 years old when my life changed forever. I was a sophomore in college studying graphic design. I loved studying art, being independent, and working at a part-time job. <clears throat> I was on my bicycle going to class when I was in an accident and sustained a severe traumatic brain injury. I don't remember much after that. <clears throat> I spent seven months in the hospital five of those in a coma. After returning home, I spent the next year in various outpatient rehabilitations for both my physical and mental recovery. I basically had to relearn just about everything. My next step was attending the Acquired Brain Injury Program through uh, Coastline Community College. There I had to face my challenges and learn strategies to compensate for my injury, such as uh, Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> Such as time management, social skills, and planning for my new future. It was through my physical therapist, who was teaching me to learn to walk again, that I was introduced to the Adapted Kinesiology program at Orange Coast College. I was immediately welcomed into my first class, which was swimming, and assigned a student volunteer to be my helper, as directed by Robin. The elements of the swim strokes were broken down into parts, taught one by one, and then blended together. I was overjoyed when I was able to swim my first lap unaided. I have continued to swim ever since, and have also taken other adapted kinesiology classes, like stretch, strength training, and bowling. I feel the camaraderie of the other students as we all struggle to push our bodies to do things we didn't think were possible. We encourage each other. Adaptive kinesiology has been instrumental in helping me retrain my body and mind to set and achieve new goals and to push myself to improve. I then decided to challenge myself to see if I could actually pass an academic class. My love of art remained unchanged, so I enrolled in the graphic design certificate program also at Orange Coast College. I started with just one class and was thrilled when I passed. I appreciate the support I find on campus at the Disabled Student Center. <clears throat> they are always there to answer questions and offer support. I have continued in the program and will earn my certificate in the next year. Life after a brain injury is not easy. I have new dreams and possibilities. I can now see myself as a graphic designer. I was doubtful that I would ever get to do that again with Robin's contagious passion I was able to take the next step to find myself again. I feel lucky to be a part of the Coast Community College District, and I'm so thankful for the vital role these programs are playing in my recovery. Thank you.
Let's congratulate again both our winners, Dr. Mystery and Professor O'Connor. As we near the end of our uh, program this morning, I want to provide a special thank you to the staff here at the Sterling Hotel, who certainly uh, made our accommodations as uh, comfortable as possible. Join me in thanking them. And I want to again thank the members of the Board of Governors, uh, Mrs. Rice and Commander Dunning, for being with us today. This concludes our program, and I hope that this event has sparked or rekindled your drive to go out and make a positive change on your campus or in your community. Thank you all very much for coming to the 15th Annual John Rice Award.